Hi, I'm Scott Vaughn. In this video, I'd like to demonstrate and explain the math and physics used in a computer simulation of the three-body problem. This is such a fascinating topic. Historically, it begins with the earliest observations of the motions of the sun and moon relative to the Earth. An early question motivating a solution to the three-body problem was the prediction of solar and lunar eclipses. Isaac Newton solved the general two-body problem in the 1600s. He essentially invented calculus, described the motion of two bodies in a gravity field, and proved the resulting orbits were always conic sections, ellipses, circles, parabolas, and hyperbolas. The mathematics for the motion of two bodies interacting gravitationally is thus relatively simple. We can predict positions and velocities for each of two bodies exactly, and forever in time, given any possible initial conditions for those two bodies, based on relatively simple formulas. But with three bodies, each of arbitrary mass, there is no closed form solution or formula like there is with the general two body problem. By closed form, I mean a solution that could be expressed with finitely many terms and finitely many operations, as can be done with the formulas for the conics in the two-body problem. Instead, modern methods for solving the general three-body problem rely on computers to calculate all relevant gravitational forces at a given instant, and then compute the resulting velocities for each body, and then update all the resulting positions for each of the bodies after a small incremental time step. Repeating this process over small increments in time, positions, forces, and velocities are all recalculated again and again. After each small incremental time step, each value is recalculated based on the current state. And this continues indefinitely, a process that could be run forwards and backwards in time for any given initial conditions. And there are so many fascinating aspects of the three-body problem. First, the history and mathematics itself and the search for a general solution to the three-body problem. And then the application to astronomy and to modeling orbits of the planets of the solar system. In fact, the orbits of all the planets in our solar system are essentially elliptical because the Sun is so much more massive than each of the planets. The gravitational influences of the planets of the solar system on each other cause only very minor perturbations from perfectly elliptical orbits. Thus, often, for many practical purposes, orbital modeling of the solar system can be done assuming just two bodies at a time, where the solutions are simple and exact, and minor perturbations can be included due to other bodies, such as other planets and moons, depending on the accuracy needed. The general three-body problem refers to solving for positions and velocities of three bodies where each body is sufficiently massive to impart a gravitational effect on each of the others. And that's the topic I'm considering here in this video. Three planets, or suns, each with arbitrary mass, in some cases equal mass, in some cases nearly equal mass. In the general three-body problem, the orbits can be chaotic. In general, there's no way to know the orbits that will result from initial conditions without calculating each position and velocity and force incrementally forward in time, as described previously, and working out the trajectories step by step. And the resulting orbits are highly sensitive to small changes in the initial conditions. A small change in an initial position or velocity of any one of the three bodies can lead to completely different orbital trajectories of all three bodies over time. Nevertheless, since the time of Newton, there have been known stable solutions to the general three-body problem, and I'll illustrate a few of those here. Stable solutions are periodic and thus predictable. Positions and velocities in the special cases of stable solutions 
are known indefinitely into the future. These are unique arrangements and beautiful patterns that arise in otherwise chaotic circumstances. I want to say thank you to Dr. Rhett Elaine, a physics professor on YouTube, whose video on the physics of the three-body problem was the inspiration for my video now. The code that I wrote here follows exactly the method that he describes in his video, and I'll link to his video in the description below. The mathematics of the general three-body problem can get very complicated very quickly, but what impressed me about Dr. Alain's video is that his model does not require any knowledge of calculus to understand. It's entirely at a pre-calculus level and uses only introductory physics concepts. So what I'm adding here in this video is my own explanation of Dr. Alain's model of the general three-body problem and some examples of stable orbits using that model. So this is it. This is the code that I've written based on Dr. Alain's approach to the general three-body problem. It's really quite short. In his video, Dr. Alain wrote the code for his model in vPython. It's a version of Python that is easy to share, runs in a web browser, and is already set up for visualizing physics concepts. It's available at trinket.io, and the term trinket refers to programs written in vPython. But before we dive into the code, let me explain a few of the basic physics principles that are involved and how that leads to the logic used to set up the simulation. Okay, so to talk through the math that's behind that simulation, I'll start with uh, Newton's law of gravity, the product of a gravitational constant that is determined by whatever units you're choosing to, to use to measure mass and distance and time with. So that's the universal gravitational constant. Uh, and then the product of the masses divided by the distance between two masses squared. Uh, and that just represents a number that is the magnitude of the force due to gravity. But here we need to figure out what directions those forces are and how far those objects are, uh, what are their relative positions and distances. And so we capture that information in a vector, the gravity force vector. And we'll use the magnitude of that force so the product of the gravitational constant, the product of the two masses, divided by the magnitude of the of the r vector. So r is this position vector. So that is the magnitude of that vector, um, or the distance, squared. And then here is a notation for a unit vector. That is a vector that has a length 1, uh, but points in the direction of the vector r. So, and in the program that I'm using, we'll refer to that as the norm of R, and it just comes from this idea of normalizing it to a unit length so it doesn't change the magnitude that we're dealing with. It only captures the information of the direction of that force. So we'll be dealing with three bodies here, uh, A and B and C, and they can be of the same mass or different masses, and we'll need to locate each of them relative to each other. So I'll use a vector to do that. And for example, here is RAB. That's the vector that points from A to B. And RBC points from B to C. RAC is pointing from A to C. And it's in that direction. So RAB indicates that specific direction. And if I put a negative on it, it's actually reversing the direction, exactly the opposite direction. And that's a very useful uh, tool to do the calculation. So in order to describe those vectors, we have the position vectors and we have the force vector. And so FAB represents the gravitational attraction that A has that's applied on B, the gravitational field that A creates, that B experiences. We could refer to it as the force of gravity that attracts B toward A. And I say it that way because I've put a negative here. So this is the magnitude the negative indicates an opposite direction to the to the direction indicated by the vector RAB. So the vector RAB is pointing from A to B, but the force vector, because of the negative, is in the opposite direction, uh, and it's pointing back this way. So FAB points from B back to A. It's really the force that attracts B toward A. That's what this is. 
So, and then force uh, BA, this vector, would be the force that attracts A toward B. These are um, opposite. And that's one of the really neat things uh, about this approach is that you only need to calculate three force vectors uh, because they're always equal and opposite um, between two bodies. And so you can just reverse uh, with a plus or minus uh, which one you want to use. So um, FBA is A's gravitational attraction toward B. FBA would be a force vector in this direction, FBA. It's the opposite of FAB. Now we also deal with the mass of each of those three bodies and their velocity and put that together in a, an expression that's the momentum, the mass times the velocity. And we'll use the principle of physics that uh, a change in momentum over time equals uh, a force, or you can equate force with change in momentum over time. So I'll look at that change in momentum as a, a discrete change between two different values, and I'll just keep the time uh, change as this one, you know, delta t representing a step of time. So the force that changes momentum can be expressed this way, and so I'll just multiply the delta t to the other side, um, and so um, and then bring this p naught over to the other side so that I can look at it. Um, an expression that involves the force and the change in momentum where I would recognize that there would be an initial momentum for each of these three bodies and then I will add to that the force that they experience times an increment of time and that will produce the final momentum after this uh, increment of time. So we'll do that for all three bodies. So just once again, I, I would just point out how I have this FAB representing the force uh, that is basically B's attraction toward A. So um, And then I have RAB that is the position vector from A to B. So this force AB is the force that's pulling B toward A. And then I can just negate that, and it represents the force that's pulling uh, A toward B. The next thing we can do is look at how our updates for the momentum for each object is related to the force that that object experiences using this basic uh, equation there, that the new momentum is the initial momentum plus some force uh, over some interval of time. And we'll do that for each of the three bodies. So uh, you can say that um, body A final momentum is its initial momentum plus this force that it experiences from the other two bodies uh, multiplied by an increment of time. And so the way that I'm looking at it is, you know, there's um, the force that A experiences in the gravity field of the objects B and C because I've already calculated force AB as being the, f the gravitational attraction that B feels toward A, then by negating that, I'm, I'm representing the force that A feels uh, the gravitational attraction it has toward B. So the gravitational force that A experiences attracting it towards C and B are these two forces, and those are the two forces with those two negatives that are the combined total force that A would experience. And it's just sort of interesting to think about, you know, those forces could be one stronger than the other, and that was what causes it to turn, uh, bend its path, um, depending on which of those is, is stronger. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to do that for each of these objects. So the um, mass B, its final momentum is whatever its initial momentum was, plus uh, this product of the forces that it experiences over some increment of time. So it's experiencing this force AB that's attracting it toward A, and this force BC, but with a negative because uh, it's, it's the um, gravitational attraction that B has toward C is expressed this way because I already calculated this one uh, pointing in that direction, and it's all because of the way in which I've defined the position vectors. Um, so, yep, that's how that works. And now we can look toward updating each of the positions based on these changing velocities and based on these changing momentums. So I would 
say that the velocity is this change in the position over time. And so it's a delta r over delta t. And I'll look at the change in position as the difference between two position vectors. Uh, and so velocity is that change in position over time. Multiply the delta t to the other side. And, um, and then add r0 on, on the other side of this equation. And we can say, all right, our initial position plus some velocity times an increment of time will give us our new position. And another really neat thing about this uh, setup is that we don't have to separately calculate the velocity. We've got the momentum, and we can just take the momentum and divide by mass. Uh, and because the mass is going to remain constant here, um, we can cancel out the, the mass and Momentum divided by mass would be the velocity of each of these uh, objects. So there's that way in which I'm updating the position based on your previous position and the velocity times an increment of time. But that velocity is going to just be expressed in the code as the momentum divided by the mass. Momentum divided by mass is velocity. So take an initial position and add velocity times an increment of time, and you get a new position. And we do that for all three bodies. A's position at the next time step is based on its previous position, uh, plus the velocity, which is the momentum of A divided by the mass of A times some increment of time, just basically following that equation there, uh, which is based on that um, new momentum that each object has as a result of all of the forces that each object experiences. And you do that for all three of the bodies, all simultaneously, and you get updating their position. And that's it. That's how the code works. OK, so here's the figure eight. Initial conditions for the position for A, position for B, and position for C. There's setting the three objects in the three-dimensional system. So I've just put the z value equal to zero here for the position. And also down here, when I set the velocity, I've got the mass times the velocity to get the momentum, the initial values for the momentum. And the third component is just zero in all of these. And then we start a counter for time, uh, increments of 0.01. There's the loop that counts as long as t is less than t max, goes through and computes those relative positions uh, and computes all of the forces. Um, only have to do three of them uh, because we can just reverse the forces for um, all of the different interactions. Update all the momentums. Uh, in the same way that I described before, update all positions, and then increment the time. I'd also display the time so I can see how far it's gone through. Uh, and then just to kind of playing around with this, I found a kind of a neat little experiment. If I just change one of these just a little bit in the mass, it creates a different kind of different pattern. It's kind of fun. These are initial conditions here that create a really fascinating pattern. I'll close here in Universe Sandbox, initial conditions listed in the description. I found this in the community workshop in Universe Sandbox. It's just so amazing to me, however unlikely this may be. It is physically possible by the laws of physics. Imagine perhaps in an infinite universe, perhaps this does occur infinitely many times. Or perhaps there's some advanced alien civilization out there so powerful it can arrange stars within a distant galaxy as a decoration or is to play with the fundamental laws of physics the way we might play with a musical instrument.